Um, so I first came across the idea of variable fonts probably around six years ago now. There um, was a working group that was led by uh, Microsoft and Apple, um, Adobe and Google. Um, and they started thinking about how we can serve fonts on the web better. Um, that was their interest to just like make web performance better. Um, and they uh, had one problem, they didn't have any girls on the team. Um, so they asked me, and I'm completely unqualified, so I'm, I'm the imposter of the group, and uh, ever since I'm being invited to more working groups where I'm also an imposter. Um, but yeah, that's life, and um, actually I, I, I kind of like found, found my niche in there. Um, but yeah, let's talk about this. Um, variable fonts. So imagine you, um, you know, you design a little website. Um, you, you maybe want to publish some recipes or something like this. Um, what you start with is uh, usually fonts. Um, you all have um, probably some content, and you have navigations, and you have headlines, and you want to like lead the eye of the reader or user um, in a way that they can find the information that they are looking for. Now everyone knows this kind of experience. Uh, sometimes you just don't see um, what you are supposed to see immediately. So you might be on a bad network or anything, or uh, there's something like uh, a flash of invisible text where the fonts that are being served to you are not loading immediately. Uh, maybe it's a lot of fonts, maybe the font files are really large, uh, maybe you're on a really bad network. Um, so sometimes it takes this little moment. Um, the other way of just like bridging this little gap until the fonts are loaded is obviously the flash of unstyled text, which is uh, just equally as bad. Uh, you have like some kind of like font you start reading and then it switches to the font that um, you're supposed to see and nobody really wants to um, experience the internet like this. Um, Google actually looked into this. They say 53% uh, of all mobile users actually walk away after three seconds if the website doesn't load until then. And I think that's Plenty generous, I never wait three seconds. Three seconds is a lifetime, and that's just like, not worth my time um, if I want to like, look up a recipe on somebody's website. Um, so yeah, I think this is, this is quite generous. Um, if we look at what people are actually looking for when they go to websites, uh, the very basic on the very bottom is that the website needs to load in order for people to stay on the website. And the second one is they need to find what they are looking for. Um, and both of those kind of like go into my field of expertise. So I'm a typeface designer uh, and I'm dabbling with type technology as an imposter on these working groups. Um, so like one of the things that I'm interested is in it's just like making things uh, work as well as possible on the web. The other thing that I'm interested in is that people can find the information that they're looking for and that they can read it um, in a nice way. So that brings me to the introduction to variable fonts. Um, so they have been around since 2016. The working group started um, probably a couple of years before that. Um, and as I said, like the, the kind of like basic idea behind this was fonts are, people are not using fonts. I think that was, uh, <laughs> that was one of the things. Like people only ever use like a regular and a medium weight of a font and of a font family and um, that's, that's about it, and web typography is boring because of it. Um, and the, the kind of problem with that was that um, it was just difficult to convince any web developer to load more fonts um, because of typography. So it was always like web performance was always more important than um, just like having a pretty site with a lot of different fonts that you know, will help people find the things that they are looking for. Um, so the kind of like working group um, made it their objective to try and find solutions that um, we can both live with. So smaller font sizes so that people can use more fonts um, to surf on the web and have nice typography there. Um, if I look at how fonts used to be served, it's in uh, little font files and one weight at a time. So if I want to use a hairline version of a font and a regular version and a black version, uh, that means I would have to make three font files available to every user who's going up to my website. And um, as soon as I go there, these fonts are being downloaded in the, back, in the background um, and then people can see my content. Um, this is for the very first time until then, you know, fonts are being cached and then they will see them immediately. If I look into the actual font files, uh, what I will find in there is a lot of um, data that looks like this. So this on the left hand side, you can see the code that um, 
represents the outline of the letter N, lowercase n, um, in the hairline weight of this particular font. So what you see is there are a lot of um, coordinates and a, a little bit of information about how these coordinates are connected to each other, which actually defines the outline of the lo lowercase letter n. If I look at the outline data for the lowercase letter n for the regular, I can see that it's very, very similar, um, but obviously the outline of the n is a little bit different, so the coordinates are sitting at different places. Um, and the same for the black outline data. So what I learned from this is that the biggest bunch of data in a font file um, is actually descriptions about each letter. And if you ever open up font files, they are actually quite large. Um, so it goes obviously beyond the 26 letters that we have in our alphabet, um, uppercase and lowercase. We have the numerals. Um, everything on our keyboard is called the ASCII set, which is like the bare minimum. But even if you have this and you only have English text, you probably come across some foreign words. So you will have to have like some um, accented characters for other Western European languages. Or if you want to set um, Eastern European languages, you have accented characters um, that are um, a lot more frequent over there. Um, you have the German double S, uh, like you have little Uber dots, you have uh, Icelandic characters. And then that is only Latin. Um, if you also have a global audience, um, you might want to add things like Arabic language support to, to it. Or Indic, there are like several Indic um, writing systems that you want to support. Um, you have CJK, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which have humongous character sets. Um, so yeah, this is what is in a font file. And each one of those letters is described in this kind of way. Um, as I said, like if you compare those outlines visually next to each other, you can see that actually the lowercase letter n in hair, regular, and black have the same number of outline points, and they kind of are connected in the same way in the, in the same spots. So if I look at this kind of like connection here, this is uh, the stem of a letter, and this is the shoulder. If I look at this connection here, we have our, like um, a point here, a point here, a point here, and then we have a curve here, uh, which is like defined by these little handles. Um, and it sits like that here on the letter N and there and there as well. So it's kind of like the same structure and they kind of re repeat each other within a family of fonts. Um, so that is what the working group um, thought was a good idea to actually simplify in um, how we serve fonts. So instead of um, just defining the outlines three times and giving people three different font files. Um, what they decided to do is define the outline ones and then only add information to the font that will tell you where those, um, where those points are traveling to. So everything is now in one font file. We don't have to serve three font files anymore. It's all compacted in one font file. And the data is actually much less if you have like three or more font files. So if I go back to my uh, mock-up <laughs> recipe website um, and actually mark the, the fonts that are being used here, um, it's actually quite a lot. Like, you don't really recognize this because it's black and white and there are no images in there. Um, but actually, the amount of fonts that I'm using is quite wide. So I have something like a regular um, weight and width in, for the running text. I have an expanded... Um, I think black weight for the headline. Um, I have some narrow for the, um, for the navigation. So I would have to serve, before variable fonts, I would have to serve like a lot of different font files to um, each of the users that go to my website. Um, but instead of that, we can now serve this in one font file, um, which is a variable font file. And this contains all of this. And I said already, um, I have different weights. So I have like a regular, I have a bold, I have a medium, a black, um, and I have different widths as well. So I've extended and narrow. Um, and these are called X's. So if I look at the design space that I will need for this one project, my recipe website, um, I would have to have a design space with a width and a weight X's. Um, so these are, these will be my extremes um, within the design space. So I have, um, a condensed uh, hair, I have a condensed black, I have an extended hair, and I have an extended black. Um, and I do the same for italics because I like italics, I want them in there as well. Um, which just means that if I wanted to serve this all as um, static fonts, I might end up with 54 
um, different font files that uh, I want to serve, but nobody would ever do this, and also nobody would ever need this um, many um, fonts. But the good news is that actually with variable fonts, you can do that, and it doesn't have any implications to the performance anymore because you're just serving this one font file anyway, and you can use any of the instances that are lying in this design space. Um, which obviously as a typographer makes me very, very happy. Um, so let's talk about the access since I already mentioned those. We um, have five um, access that are defined in the OpenType specification and the OpenType specification is um, where everything about font files is kind of like being defined. Um, it's owned by, by Microsoft and it's maintained um, by this working group and, uh, and, and some different other ones. Um, and they added, for the variable font um, edition, they added um, five different access to the, to the set. Um, the, one, the first one is the weight access, which is probably the most known. Um, so you have everything, you can access anything between hairline and black um, if you wanted to, because hairline is usually the lightest one and black is the blackest one. Um, so the weight access is the most common one and it's actually being used quite a lot. Um, the second most common one is probably the width axis, so narrow to expanded um, and everything in between. The third axis that is um, defined on the spe in the spe specification is the slant axis, uh, which is not as common, but it's actually quite useful as well. So this is if you have um, uprights and italics in the same design space and you want to access them. Um, it, it might just be that you know the, design, the type designer made a very inclined um, italic and you just like don't feel like a 14 degree kind of slant in it um, so you want to just like define your own version of this. Um, I don't think it's as much used as um, the width and the weight axis but um, here we are, it's there. Uh, there's also something called the italic axis and you can see the difference is binary instead of um, uh, you being able to see all of the instances in between, uh, which makes not that much sense for this kind of design. I think I would um, choose a slant axis for this one, but it makes a lot of sense for this kind of design um, where you actually have variations between the letter forms. So here you can see a serif font um, and it kind of changes the structure of the font quite a lot between the uprights and the italics. It's more of a cursive italics, so we have variations um, between the letter forms like the lowercase letter A, it changes from double story design to a single story design, and then a lot of um, other things are changing too, like the serif on the bottom of the I, for example, or the serif on the bottom of the R completely disappears. Um, there's no spur on the bottom left of the letter B, for example. So like a lot of things are changing, and if you made this available as a non-binary, um, access, then uh, you would be able to get like all of the instances that are interpolating between a single story and a dub, um, double story A, and that would not look nice, and you don't want to make this available to everyone. Right, then we also have this. Um, this is the last axis that is defined in the, in the spec. It's called the optical size axis, and uh, you probably look at it and think, like, what, what the fuck is this? That doesn't make any sense. Um, it's kind of like the same letter, but it's getting fatter. Um, but what it does actually is quite smart. Um, so it kind of uh, accounts for how large a size you're using the font in. Um, so on the top, you can see, like, the difference in design um, is that the, the top version has a lot of thin hairline elements in there and you can use it at like large sizes. Um, I bet the last couple of rows can actually uh, not see the hairline, at least not if you have eyesight of a 39 year old. Um, but like it, it's kind of like falling apart, even if you use it in large sizes at a large distance, um, you know, you, you, can, you want it to be like really big and impactful. It, it has a really lovely design. It looks really like delicate. Um, and you can, I can think of like lots of applications where I would use that, um, but it doesn't make any sense to use the top version as a text font or even as a caption font. So optical size access basically accounts for this and makes adjustments to the design. Um, so you can see if you compare the top to the bottom one, for example, the hair, hairline elements all got beefed up, um, so they're a lot thicker and you can still read them if they are in small sizes. The letters overall um, are quite more generous in, in the proportions, so they expand a little bit vertically and horizontally. 
Um, and just like overall, it's just adjusted in a way that um, you can read it in smaller sizes. So an optical size axis can actually do this. And because you are, stop moving, there we go. And because you are on the web, you can actually link this. Um, so if uh, people are zooming in, for example, my dad um, likes to zoom into everything because he, he kind of ignores the fact that his eyes are just getting worse and worse. Uh, so he zooms a lot. Um, imagine if uh, it could recognize this and just choose a different optical size axis um, instance to suit his needs in this case. Um, and then there are things that are just not defined in the specification, but that are a lot of fun. Um, so these are the kind of things that you um, can make use of if you have complete control over where things are ending up. Um, but if you are just relying on the browser to support your access, then it's probably safer to stick to the um, to the specification because they are all supporting that. Um, but if you do have control over things, uh, you can get like really, really expressive. So this is a font that we designed, I think a couple of years ago in the, in the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it's a, it's a font that uh, can melt. So it has a melt axis, it has a weight axis as well, but it also has a melt axis and the melt axis um, is, is basically treating the letters as if they are chocolate melting in the sun. Um, and they kind of like expand and they get all kinds of like soft and overlap with the next letter, um, which is the beauty of this design. And you can do something like this um, and just serve it as a, as a um, um, variable font and people can use it, the instance and link it up to live data. So if I wanted to just like have something interactive in the city of Bristol and um, I have a font with a melt access, for example, maybe I uh, could just link it up to the data about the temperature in the city at the moment or about you know, the, the, the amount of people in this room, which are obviously um, helping make this a lot warmer. Also, if you, if you talk, you get really warm. Anyway, I would be on the very right-hand side of the axis at the moment. Um, but this is the beauty of it. Like you can, you can do anything with variable fonts and there has been so much done in the last four years, four, five, six years now. Um, as type designers, I think we got like especially curious about this kind of thing because uh, like since Gutenberg, nothing really has changed for us, um, which is like 500 plus years. Um, and so suddenly uh, things were starting to move a little bit for us and we were like, oh, this is nice. It can be like lots more expressive and we can do things on the web. Um, so a lot of type designers were really interested in, in variable fonts in the very beginning um, and are still now. Um, so they output like a lot of different stuff, like a lot of expressive, experiments where we were just like, yeah, let's do a melt axis, let's do this, let's do a spacing axis. Um, and you can find a lot of variable fonts out there. If you actually want to look, um, there's a good website for this, um, which um, kind of like collects most of the variable fonts that are out there. It's called v-fonts.com um, and it's run by Nick Sherman. Um, so you will find a lot of like really fun ones over there. Um, but, but it kind of like stopped there a little bit. Like, I feel like type designers got really excited. And then um, every time I talk about these, like the people are looking at me and we're just like, oh my God, this is like so interesting. Let's, let's definitely do this. And then nobody really uses them. Um, and I don't really know why. So let's talk a little bit about integration. Um, if you look at applications that support um, variable fonts, you will find that obviously it will never work in Office. Um, I have a colleague uh, who studied with me type design 10 years ago in, in Reading, and he's now working at the, in the advanced reading group in, at Microsoft. And he tells me that 90% of the users of Word never even click the drop down menu. So he's like, like don't hold your breath, this is never going to come. Um, but it's, uh, it's working in a lot of the Adobe applications, obviously at varying degree of um, consistency, as with all <laughs> Adobe products. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's working in like InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop. Photoshop was the first one, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's not working in XD yet, which is an uh, uh, oversight, I think, same for After, After Effects. Um, it's working in Sketch, and since a few weeks, it's also working in Figma, which is good news. 
Um, if you look at browser compatibility, since this was like led by Microsoft and Apple and uh, Google and Adobe, it's obviously working in all of the browsers and it's been working there for a while. So they were like a little bit ahead of like everyone because they knew about this before it was actually announced. Um, so they implemented it really, really quickly. It's working in all of the latest versions. If you're worried about like anyone um, being on older versions than these, then you know, you can always serve um, static fonts as, as a fallback strategy. And talking of serving variable fonts, it's really, really easy. Uh, you link the fonts, like you always do. You link the header tag. And then the only difference is that you apply font variation settings. So this is um, basically like looking at the instance that you want to use in your design space um, and just like specifying it in your CSS. And that is also where you can actually like link it to live data, like the temperature in Bristol. Um, but yeah, you can see here, there, in this case, the font has two axes. It's the weight axis and the width axis. And you just define a numerical value within this space um, and then set, set it there and say, like, OK, this is the font that I want to use in this kind of instance. Um, now, I'm talking really fast, but, uh, well, I think Gavin was, like, was a little bit longer anyway. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about costs. Um, this is like this is a really difficult topic. Uh, we, we talked about this since the very beginning when when variable fonts were announced as an industry, where we were just like, okay, well, it's just one font file, so let's just ask for the price of one font file. And we're like, oh no, wait a second. Actually, it takes us the same amount of work that we would usually put into a whole family of fonts. Uh, so it's not fair to just ask for the price of one font file. So. Uh, some people were just like, okay, well, if people are buying the whole family, they can get the variable font for free, um, which also doesn't make any sense because even if you buy the whole family, you might not just like use all of the styles. Um, like, who needs 54 different fonts? That's that's not fair either. Um, so there are different approaches, and if you want to look at the costs for variable fonts, you unfortunately, as with everything in the type industry, have to do this like one by one, foundry by foundry, um, and just like have to like go through their their pricing strategy. Um, for us, it made sense to kind of like have a price cap at um, at four weights. So we said that if people are spending the same amount of money um, as they would for four weights of um, of a static font family, uh, that probably makes a lot of sense because you would use variable fonts um, in that way. So that's for the fonts that you can actually like buy on, on, the, on, on, on our library. Um, but as I said, like this is like really, really different for every found foundry, um, and you will find different approaches there. Um, a lot of people like the BBC or Amazon um, come to us because they want custom fonts for their um, for their company and uh, the pricing there is a little bit different and it kind of depends on the effort that we are putting into this. So if I look at, if, if somebody came to me and said like, okay, Bianca, we want like um, a design space that is just a weight axis and it ex extends from regular to bold, um, like what would that cost as a variable font? Uh, it would probably be relatively easy for us to design because we would design all of the outlines for the regular, we would design all of the outlines for the bold, and then everything in, in between is like automatically interpolated because they are so related to each other. It's relatively easy and straightforward. There's not a lot of tidy up work to do. But if somebody came to me and asked me um, for a family that extends from hairline to black, um, that's a whole different other story because the hairline, if you look at this in this design, which is like a really straightforward grotesque design, um, the hairline weight actually is almost monolinear. So you can see like a very little differentiation between the thicks and the thins of the letter. But if you look at it in the black, you can see that we needed to do a lot of compensation. So the vertical stems are kind of like the same, kind of like width that you would expect in, the, in a black weight, but then kind of like this joint, between the stem and the shoulder here, you can see that it tapers down a lot. And this is because there's not a lot of space inside the black letter, and if we made it monolinear, it would just take up too much space and it would be legible. Um, which means that there's a lot of compensation in the black, um, while the hairline might be almost monolinear. Um, if we would interpolate between those, the stuff that we would get in the middle, so like regular and medium weights, would be a little bit mangled up, and it's not how we would like to read them. 
Um, so they would have probably a greater amount of compensation that we would want. Um, so what we need to do is like put a little tent pole up in the middle and uh, have like three um, designs that we are putting into the um, design space that are actually being designed by us. Which means it's obviously a little bit um, more extra effort for us to design three different weights than we do for two different weights, which means that um, a variable font with a weight axis that extends for like this amount of variation um, is actually probably going to be a little bit more expensive. If I then look at other um, axes, I, I didn't actually say that. You can, you can combine axes, <laughs> so you can have like lots of different axes in the fonts. So you can have a weight and a width axis and an italic axis. You can have a weight and a melt axis in there and all kinds of like different combinations. I think Google last month um, released a font that had like um, a lot of parametric access so you can actually like um, move a lot of those things around um, in order to find the variation that you want which also kind of like leaves a lot of um, like you, you can manipulate them in a way that the, the letter forms all mangled up but obviously that was not the idea behind it but anyway you can combine like lots of different access into like one variable font um, if you do that, it also means that people will have to draw more, um, which if you want a custom font, this talk um, is just like more expensive. Right, um, I'm kind of like, every time I talk about this, people are excited, I said that, um, and I, I would like to leave with a little bit of inspiration about like what you can actually do with um, variable fonts. So the first one is, um, this one, so this is using variable fonts in, in a very smart way, um, but it's only like a tiny adjustment. If you look at those weights and you compare, for example, the extra light um, on the left-hand side with the extra light on the right-hand side, I hope you will find that those weights are identical, which I can tell you they're actually not. Um, so there's this halo effect that you will have um, every time you use white on black. Uh, white letters on black background um, that makes the letters appear a little bit um, heavier than they are. So in order to um, make those appear the same way, the extra light on the left with black on white um, versus the extra light on the right with the white on black text, uh, we actually needed to design a version of the extra light that is just a little bit less heavy um, than, the, than the one on the right hand side for um, dark mode if people are using um, a dark mode setting. So the difference is really, really tiny, as you can see here, um, and it doesn't refloat the text, so it's kind of, it's, it's an optical size axis, but it's really a great axis, which is like a variation of optical size. Um, but what it does is kind of like beefing up some of the bits, and sorry, actually beefing down, I guess, <laughs> um, making things a little bit slimmer um, for when you use it in dark mode settings um, in order to just like reverse this halo effect. Another thing, this is like one of those early experiments where everyone was just like, wow, I can resize windows without like text reflowing, uh, which, you know, you can do to an extent, um, but uh, yeah, have fun with it. Um, you can also use it in AR and VR, which is really quite interesting. So this is, uh, this is an example that uses a static font on the top and a variable font on the bottom. And you can see that if you move around in an AR space, um, and you have like letters, um, sometimes you end up being at an angle that is unfortunate. On the top you can see, because the letters are not actually uh, moving in any way, um, it's getting really tricky to read them at an angle, at a steep angle to the type. Um, but on the bottom, the, it uses a width um, axis and it kind of like expands the letters vertically just a little bit, so it's, as you just like move around in your AR space, uh, you can actually still read things even if you're at a, a steeper angle, which I think is quite fun for this kind of environment and it's quite fun for um, perhaps gaming as well. Um, and then you can be like super expressive with things as well. It's just like, you know, you have the functionality side of it where you go like, oh, I can serve more fonts on the web and it's gonna be cheaper for me, uh, which is great. Um, but then you can also just like have like lots of fun with it and you can uh, use it in these kind of ways where you just like alternate between the widths of things and also perhaps the design of it. Um, as I said, you can use um, uh, live data in order to make things melt. Um, and this is like one of those examples where um, you actually, sorry, there we go. 
uh, where they actually use it in a way where it's, it's, it's just very sensible. So this is Nielsen IQ. It's like one of the first ones that actually used variable fonts in the way that it was designed to do. Um, and you can see it's just like one font that is being served. Um, on the whole website, but you, you could see already the hierarchy. So they're using very different styles. They're using extended and normal width. Um, I don't think they're using any condensed, but you know you can see they're actually serving a font that has three different axes, um, and it's just this one font in, in there, um, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's, it's economic, and it makes a lot more sense for typography because we can go beyond just using regular and bold which is great, um, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, but actually, I have not a visual <laughs> for you, but like a little bit of um, a thought, perhaps, on like how, how we can move forward with this technology. Um, because like one of these things is just like making, you know, nice typography on the web um, or expressive typography if you want something interactive, uh, which is a nice thing. But like, I want to go back to my dad who's losing his eyesight. Um, but like, basically, like how, how could we use this technology in a way that it would be like personalized to everyone? Like, um, perhaps it takes things into account that my phone already knows. So if I'm reading stuff on my phone, um, it knows already that my what my envir uh, environmental light is like. It knows that I'm you know, sitting on the tube in London, or it knows that I'm being shined at by this really bright thing there. Um, or um, it, you know, it, it kind of like knows what time of the day it is. Um, it probably could know um, some details about my preferences of how I like to read. Um, perhaps it knows that my dad is always pinching in to, uh, to, to read the fonts. Like, could it actually be used in a way that it overrides some aspects of the UI um, in a way that you know, just helps people consume content a little bit easier? Um, so maybe we can go back to these 53% like, that are just like, walking away when uh, the website doesn't load in like three seconds. Like, maybe it can go beyond that, and maybe we can just actually make it more pleasurable to read. Um, on the web, and yeah, I think that's that's my last that's my last thoughts. Uh, I expect a call in in a few weeks at my birthday, um, and until then, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>